Well, that's a look at the dailies for you this morning. But you may have seen that story about the NLC meeting with the federal government, which ended in a deadlock. Well, we'd like to speak with someone who knows what transpired, just in case you're wondering, how did this happen? And we have joining us this morning, uh, Joe Ajero, who is vice president of the NLC. Good morning. Thank you for joining us on Sunrise Daily. Good morning. Well, we know that Labour had that round of meetings with the federal government some months back, and then you suspended that strike. But now this one, still maybe concerning the same issues, but what exactly played out? Because we expect meetings like that to end fruitful, but it seemed this one did not end fruitful at all. What exactly transpired? Well, I think uh, when the action was suspended a few months back in October precisely, there was some basic understanding, you know, that some of them may have not been open to Nigerians, among which is uh, the issue of no, uh, the prices of petroleum products can no longer be increased until the refineries are, you know, um, uh, the, the turnaround maintenance on refineries are completed. And that we can't allow petroleum products to be import driven. It was on the basis of that you know, that we said there will be local refining. And then some agreements were on palliatives, you know, on a tariff for the electricity committee, and they are still working. Now, we had a series of meetings fixed ahead to make sure we monitor this process. While that was on, you know, then somebody went behind and increased the same prices of petroleum products and invited us to a meeting. So while at the meeting, we have to return to status quo. The person has to re reduce that price before we go into further discussion. That was exactly what happened. Uh, hear what uh, the Honorable Minister of uh, Labor and uh, Employment also said right now. We had already a circulated agenda for the meeting. They have it. And uh, in a meeting, if you want to change the agenda, everybody will agree. That is how meetings uh, proceedings go. So there was no consensus at the end on that. And uh, we felt that the item of uh, increase in PMS, having been listed at all as an additional item, will have satisfied everyone. Yeah, so Mr. Ajero, it seems that that explanation doesn't hold water with you. You're not satisfied, the fact that it was included at all? No, no, no. C clearly, at meetings, at meetings, the both parties draw the agenda or they accept what is drawn. You don't railroad us into an already prepared agenda. He, you know, he, 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 will, he should testify that we wrote him later when that issue of increase in pump price of petroleum products came up. And he didn't put it until we started discussing it. He wanted us to go and discuss palliatives and all those other issues when this one is pending. You know, so and we said, no, let's trash this. It was at that point that what really happened at that meeting happened. And at last he's saying that the meeting will reconvene within 24 hours. He can't tell us when to reconvene. So those are issues that we need to put together and see the mode of, uh, of doing things in this country. Uh, concerning the whole idea of deregulation, what representation did government give to you at that last meeting? What's in public domain is that deregulation has come to stay and that uh, the price of uh, fuel will be uh, determined by market forces. Is that an understanding you had at that last meeting that you talked about? We didn't accept deregulation until we, we, we conclude the issue about local production. We didn't accept the regulation that would be import driven. That never happened. Now, but we agreed that if you are going to deregulate, you can't equally re regulate in a deregulated sector. That was clear to everybody, every dick and harry. And then we, we didn't say government or its agencies or the NPC should announce prices. If, you are the, if they have deregulated, they can't announce prices. The prices in you know, can be the same thing as Sokoto. It can be the same thing as Lagos in a deregulated market. So they can't go into the issue of price fixing and tell us that they have deregulated. I think they are not fair to what, what is uh, being discussed. Or maybe any of the parties seem not to understand the concepts of deregulation and uh, regulation.
Well, uh, Mr. Ajero, one of the things that I also recall the Minister of, uh, Minister of State for Petroleum Resources saying is that the whole idea of all of those structures that sustained the, deregulation, the, regu the regime of subsidy, um, such as um, Petroleum Trust Fund, the uh, PPPRA, and all of those ones, would, be, would still be in place until the Petroleum Industry Bill has been ratified and signed into law. Uh, are you of that same understanding, or you think, so in that light, if you agree that that should be, you know, what, where, should, where do we go from here? Well, I, I think even the PPRA never met for them to even announce the price, uh, current price. The government has these agencies in place, but they are not following them. You see a situation that we wake up and hear something, you know, and it happens day in, day out. Even in the existence of those structures, the last three or four price increases, whatever, when did not pass through the process. The, so that, that's the, the thing, that Mr. Jero. That's the thing that the, I think government was trying to communicate, at least that's the understanding a number of people may have, that since government has deregulated, there is no significant relevance for a PPPRA that determines the prices of fuel simply because it is an institution that sustained the subsidy, subsidy regime. No. The issue of PPPRA was a product of collective agreement as we are discussing. Labor has representatives there. All other agencies have, uh, employers have representatives there. All those agencies, if there is need, compelling need, you know, to stop them or to destabilize them or to cancel them and move into a dictatorial market by either an NPC or uh, that should have happened. But they can't be there and the law permits them to go through this process and decide what should be uh, the, uh, the, the, the price. And you say you have jettisoned them without any law, you know, abrogating them. I don't think that is true. You know, this meeting hasn't held, <coughs> excuse me, that meeting hasn't held as it ought to hold, and this is where we are now. What are the options, and what are Nigerians supposed to look forward to within the next coming days? Well, the Labour has to meet with its organs. The last exercise we had had its own interpretations, and we were painted by black before Nigerians. We insisted, and even our colleagues from Nupeng were able to prove that there were even containers of product of uh, equipment for the turnaround maintenance, and to you know get our refinery to start working. And it was on the basis of that we said, okay, now let's go into this. And let's take some time to repair the refineries. And then the agreements were signed with timeline for meetings. You know, and this is one of such meetings that were fixed before now. And when they increased, a letter was written to them that you are violating what we agreed. And when we met this time around, you know, it was another story. So Labour will meet definitely, you know, within some uh, days now. And to equally see whether just a very quick one, Mr. Jero, just a very quick one, very, very short and straight to the point, five seconds. <laughs> Is a strike an option on the table? Well, strike has always been an option where ag agreements were not reached, clearly. And you know that we had a suspended strike re revolving around this. So if the, if the agreement is not obeyed, we can reactivate the strike. We have to thank you very much, Mr. Preempt, I will not preempt the organs of the, of the Congress All in right. the decision that I'm going to take. We understand. Well, we have to thank you very much uh, for your time this morning, Joe Ajero, Deputy President of the Nigeria Labour Congress. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Yeah. So we're back in a moment. Please stay with us. Well, the whole idea of going into a recession is not new to many nations, not even Nigeria. Well, yes, you know, we are having a second one within the past four or five years. But then some have also alluded to the fact that Way back in 1987, when Nigeria had a recession, we had to take some very drastic economic decisions as well, just as we are now. But this one is occasioned by a global um, health emergency, a pandemic. That is what we have now. And is Nigeria so badly hit? And what are the figures saying? What are the realities saying? Sometimes they say...
as a challenge with that one. But we have two gentlemen discussing this issue with us this morning. Marcelo Keke is an economic consultant and CEO of Mascot Consult Limited. He is also a board member of the Nigeria Economic Summit Group, NESG. He joins us virtually this morning. Thank you, Mr. Okike, for joining us for this conversation. We also have uh, Mr. Tunde Thomas, who is an economist and associate director at GDL Asset Management Limited. Thank you very much for your Thanks time. for having me. Let Morning, me begin with yes. you. Yes, uh, let me begin with you, Mr. Okeke. Clearly, we are not hearing of this for the first time. So many people have already alluded to it. You also heard the Minister of Finance saying there that this is likely to happen. And a number of people in the real sector, in the organized private sector, have been alluding to the fact that there is a possibility that we would go into a recession. Could it, could it have been avoided? Um, thank you for this question. There is no way we could have avoided it because the, the, the factors responsible for going into a recession this time uh, are beyond our control. You have external and internal factors. So the external factors we couldn't control, you know, like the COVID-19 pandemic that uh, led to the shutting down of uh, the Nigerian economy for several months. And then the supply chain disruption, you know, globally. So there's no way, you know, we would have handled it locally, including the, the crash in the price of oil, which is the mainstay of our economy. You know, and we are trading. Who do we trade with? When, uh, 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 you know, flights were short, plane flights, you know, economies were shut down, nobody is allowed to come in, people are not allowed to go out, and so on and so forth. So what could we have done? At that point in time, the factories that utilize our oil abroad, they were not functioning. And so we, we even had nothing to export. So all that, you know, are now showing in this level of, um, you know, decline in GDP that we are seeing. And locally, you have this issue of uh, insecurity, insecurity that appears to be going out of hand, you know, whether you're talking about kidnapping, whether you're talking about armed robbery, whether you're talking about banditry, whether you're talking about, uh, um, you know, uh, cultism, whether you're talking, all kinds of things. You have social unrest all over the place. So when you aggregate all this, that is what we are seeing now as this level of drop in GDP. I must even say that uh, I am pleasantly surprised that it didn't go uh, below the uh, second quarter 2020 level and that it came up to uh, a negative three point, you know, uh, two, three. And I was thinking it would go much lower than the second quarter. So, but in any case, those are the issues. So many things went out of hand. External reserve dropped significantly because you were not exporting oil, you know, and if you exported, the price of oil crashed to almost. Uh, uh, near zero. And so what do you realize? And our, 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 our country continues to depend so much on oil, even as we speak. The so-called uh, the diversification, I think to me, largely remains a mere symptom. Sorry, government may, may have been doing or might be doing so many things you know, to diversify the economy. But in reality, the impact has not started showing you. You know, so that's well, we'll come to some of those issues, Mr. Okeke. Some of those issues about the oil and the non oil sector, we'll come to that one. But let me begin. Let's uh, have your opening comment here, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Is, is, it, is it possible for us to have avoided you know, this recession because we knew it was coming? Um, it's, um, it's impossible to have avoided it because the main causative factors of the recession are actually not within the um, control of the Nigerian economy. They are extraneous in nature. Um, the impact of COVID-19 is, um, as a global pandemic is um, far reaching. Currently today in the world, um, we have more than 18 con countries in recession as we speak. And the likelihood that some others are still going to go into recession is very high. The, the situation whereby, I mean, the economies were on lockdown, Production of good and goods and services were um, disrupted. Supply chain all over the world was disrupted as a um, great impacts on, I mean, the impact of recession in Nigeria. And um, avoiding it, maybe we could have um, reduced it in a way if we had come out of the lockdown 
slightly earlier than we did. But um, essentially, too, because of the challenges of um, the risk of um, infection and the um, effects it will have on the economy, I don't think there was a way we could have done that mm. much earlier than we did. But then perhaps but, that also, beg your pardon, okay. perhaps that's also raised the issue, a challenge that a number of people have also alluded to, the trade-off between protecting people's health yeah. and protecting the economy. Every country had a challenge making that trade-off. Okay. Was this something that could have been done anyway? Well, I think um, our own timing, to an extent, uh, the gradual opening of, of the economy started um, when we saw that the cases were on a decline to an extent. If we had done it much earlier, perhaps um, the level of infection could have accelerated. So we needed to strike a balance between um, keeping the economy in um, expansion of growth phase and challenging the impacts of COVID-19 um, infection generally. Um, I think if I were to score our response so far, I think uh, by and large, the government has tried in that regard. The critical thing we need to look at is, I mean, the figures show that um, in quarter two of the year, the GDP declined by 6.1%. The last quarter, quarter three, it declined by 3. Um, about 3.64%. It shows a reduction in the decline. So in the quest for recovery, I can see, I mean, after having gone to the abyss of 6.10, we are on a steady climb back. But the challenges, from what I can see, is um, the recovery from this recession might take the shape of a W curve. Um, essentially, what I mean by that is we dropped to 6.1, um, we are back to 3.64. Um, there is a likelihood that after the um, boost in the economy occasioned by the Yuletide um, season and all that, with the second wave of um, infections gradually, I mean, spreading all over the world, there is a likelihood for another minor decline towards the first um, two months of next year, before we now start seeing the effects of the various vaccines that have been discovered take shape and generally loosen up and open up the economy so that activities can now start going, I mean, as um, normal. Mm. So for you, it's a W? It's a W, yeah. Okay, let's find out from Mr. KK. Before I ask you what shape you see, whether you <laughs> be W or whichever it is you see, I'd like to take you up on this because, I mean, you can't take this away. In 2016, Nigeria entered a recession. We exited a year after. In 2020, about four years later, we're also in another recession. And two issues here. Is this just a case of circumstances or there's something really with this administration when it comes to the economy, managing things that might happen and how we prepare ourselves? What do you see? Is that for me? Is that for me? Yes, that question is for you. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, if, if, like I, I did uh, mention the factors that, you know, are responsible for the current one, my many factors, external factors, if you like, exogenous, that we are not within the control of this, um, you know, government and this economy. But in 2016, I can say that uh, recession could have been avoided or could have been minimized. Yes, so many factors are, you know, lead to this recession, including the, uh, you know, weak management or improper management of the economy, you know, like, um, like my colleague there mentioned. For instance, we are now, we now, we are now seeing that the, the decline of the economy in the second quarter, you know, was much more than the decline in this second quarter. So it does follow all things being equal, that with better management of the economy, you know, it, it, we are likely to even do better in the, la in, the, in the last quarter. The management of the economy, now that we already know, you know, what are our challenges, you know. But the, the more we try to do that, the more challenges we are likely to have. The, the, the route to get, I mean, the route, route to achieving what I'm now saying is, for instance, uh, uh, the issue of diversification of the economy, 
why why will government not effectively diversify the economy you know by massively you know supporting other sectors of the economy rather than oil alone i mean that 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 takes what is called focus and strategy now we're also talking about digital economy why will that not be fast track and the necessary infrastructure put in place you know now that we know the corona virus pandemic is still with us but I think we are we are we are we are knowing we are now knowing better how to manage it. That is why the number of casualties, you know, in the past couple of days or weeks has gone down reasonably. So now that we are knowing uh, how to handle coronavirus pandemic and observing all the uh, you know safety uh, nets, so I believe that things will get better. It's a question of taking the decision and putting in place the appropriate policies, you know, so that this economy is not a rocket science. I mean. We don't exist in isolation, you know. The other economies of the world. Let me also say, it, 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 so our, our challenge is also largely a human factor. Because when we mention uh, that other uh, countries are going into recession and all that, is the Nigeria economy like any other economy? What are we producing? What are we exporting? What do we have? And so on and so forth. So it's one thing to say other economies are also going into recession, you know, to uh, assuage our, our worry and all that. But it's another thing to know that we have a peculiar situation. What of the level of corruption that our president has, you know, we are, we are told, has also attempt, accepted as corruption, you know, everywhere. Is it like that in other climes? So if these things are properly tackled head on, like corruption, you know, mismanagement, you know, leakages in the system, leakages, you know, and look at, let me tell you this one, for example, look at 2021 budget. By because of this recession we are in now, it needs to be rejected. The assumptions, the basis for arrival at those figures that you have in the 2021 budget, no longer, much of them no longer exist. If you talk about the exchange rate, for example, was it not based or is it not based on $360 per barrel? And where we are now? Where, where are we now? Are we not pushing towards $500 uh, naira per dollar? Or the level of oil production that was assumed. Where are we today? We are at 1.67. When uh, we are we, we put in the budget something close to uh, uh, 2.0 uh, million dollars per barrel, you know. So if certain things are handled well, economy management, you know, certainly we will minimize the level of recession or even quickly come out of it. It's not a rocket science. What shape do you see before we come back to Lagos? Is it a V, a W, a U for you? Or maybe a shape we don't even know about? Given, given what I know about us in this economy, it's going to be a U shape, you know, curve. Meaning that it will not come out immediately. It's not going to be a V. Because it's the same people, it's the same style, it's the same pattern. If you, if you keep doing one thing and think you get a different result, it's very unlikely. You know, because... Mm -hmm. The, the consumer purchasing power is highly badly hit, you know, it's badly hit. Where is, it, where is the consumption level that will pull up certain things, you know? That is why the level of inflation will continue to get worse, you know? And, what, yeah. and whatever you do to them inflation, you pay for it, you know, somehow. So it's going to well, be U-shaped. Okay. Well, interesting. We're talking about now that we are talking about shapes. There are a number of um, shapes that are included in that uh, report. By the this one, for instance, um, is that the red one uh, points to you what's happening in the real oil sector, and the blue one, almost a straight line, uh, talks about what we have in the non-oil sector. Mr. Thomas, it would seem from this graph and the one you know to come that we seem to have fared so much better over the years consistently on a you know regular basis in the non-oil sector than we have in the oil sector is that saying anything to us um the oil sector essentially was subject to the whims and caprices of the international oil markets and um, in this particular year whereby demand for i mean energy was reduced because i mean people were locked down worldwide production levels reduced in factories and all that demand for i mean um, i mean output Revenue, which is yeah. oil is i mean reduced so currently oil accounts for about um, 90 percent of nigeria's foreign exchange and um, foreign exchange earnings and about 60 percent of government revenues so we are largely an oil-dependent economy. Mm. Until we start to shift focus from oil to the non-oil sector, 
boost agricultural exports and uh, manufacturing and all that, increase value chain and all. And in doing so, we engage um, a lot of the people in the rural areas, the youths are uh, agitating. We need to get them, I mean, into the productive sector. Uh, one, one minute, Mr. Thomas. Okay. Clearly, from the NBS figures, yes. we have contributed more than 90, about 96, 97% more of that into the GDP from the non-health sector. 97% of contribution into the non-health sector into the economy came from the non-oil sector. Yes. The rest of it came from the oil sector. From the oil sector yeah. What else do we need to tell us <laughs> where we should make our main stay? Or is it it's, that the non-oil sector that is contributing so much from the figures of the MBS is not as strong, is not as standard, is not as contributory, or what? In terms of um, foreign exchange earnings, it's not as much as what we realize from the whole sector. Okay. Largely, like I said earlier, about 90% um, of our foreign exchange earning mm. is uh, dependent on the oil sector. Yeah, despite the fact that the non-oil sector has, I mean, attributed uh, to the growth of um, GDP, we need to still look at how to develop that sector. For instance, um, we are boosting agriculture, but I mean, there are still issues with value chain. The level of production has increased. Crops are being thrown out of the farms in large quantities. But then we don't have um, the right equipment, storage, processing, and all that to keep those goods or to even add value to those um, inputs that are coming from the farm. These, I mean, are the um, sectors that we need to look at to boost um, economic activity mm. in the economy mm. in order to, I mean, have... Um, a better balance of payment um, terms with our foreign partners mm -hmm. and to increase our non, non oil um, revenues. You know, just, just before we take on Mr. Okike, I mean, for a lot of Nigerians, the question is usually, how does this affect me? Clearly, they've, we've been in recession before the MBS put it out because this is for the quarter we just ended. So clearly, Nigerians have been in recession now in some sense before the figures came out. Yes. So for people now, in terms of businesses, those who are employed, that don't own their businesses, those who are unemployed, those who live from hand to mouth, as they say. How is this recession going to affect them, essentially? Okay. Now um, that we're in a recession, government's um, ability to spend has been um, ampered. It trickles down to the individuals on the streets. Companies are not able to produce as much because aggregate demand has reduced. This will lead to a lot of um, companies, SMEs and the others, um, cutting costs by downsizing. There will likely be an increase in unemployment. There will be a decline in um, purchasing power. Generally, the layman on the streets will feel the, 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 the effects of um, the recession by way of not having the liquidity of resources to spend on its everyday consumables. Mm -hmm. So that's the immediate um, effect it's going to have. Beyond that, um, the important thing is not to dwell on the current recession, it's to look at the way out. Okay. Because I can see, I mean, from the data um, available, that if we continue this trend, the major cause, like I said earlier, is the global pandemic. And with the opening up of the economy, now people are beginning to move around freely the transportation sector, aviation sector are beginning to see a bit of um, activity with a bit of um, stimulus from the government by way of um, palliatives and incentives to critical sectors in the economy. I'm sure within the next two, three months, we'll be on the way out of this um, current okay. session. Well, Mr. OKK, um, you've seen the figures, you've seen the graph as well, and um, the shapes from the figures of the NBS. Is it any comfort that we seem to have done better in the non-oil sector in the quarter under review than in the oil sector. 91.3% uh, from the non-oil sector was contributed to the GDP as opposed to 8.73% in the oil sector. Uh, yes, on one hand, on one hand we'll be happy that the non-oil sector is accounting for that you know, measure. Uh, that part of GDP. But on the other hand, you know that 
there's no magic about it. We are still substantially an oil dependent economy. You know, so why the non oil sector is engaging so many people, you know, providing jobs and livelihood here and there. But when it comes to the issue of money, hard currency, you know, which rules the world, we, we, are, we, are, we are in trouble because we depend on oil and we don't control the price of the oil. Now that we control the quantity we export and even the quantity we produce locally because of some social challenges, we, 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 are, we, are, we are not in control. So when you when you juxtapose you know these two sides, you find out that yes, you'll be celebrating the performance of the non-oil sector. But it's also important, you know, that the non-oil sectors, whatever activities are going on there, are you know prioritized by the government and more focus put on them, so that some of them will begin to assist, I put it in quote, assist oil in running this economy. Assist oil. My colleague has quoted. Yes, when it comes to foreign exchange uh, inflow to this economy, we depend on oil for over 90 something percent, you know. And so, where, which which other product do we export to get hard currency? Until we arrive, we arrive, arrive at that point, there's no effective diversification of the economy. You know, some people are in agriculture, but that is a largely subsistence farming they are doing, you know. And so, we need mechanized farming. We need yeah. large scale farming. <laughs> We need to do all that value-added things so that effectively we now start exporting those things to support oil. So that right. the shock in oil does not always shock this economy to its, you know, uh, uh, great. Diversifying uh, the economy from the oil to the non-oil sector is something that we've been talking about for so many years. But you also, Mr. Okeke, you raised some issues um, earlier that of things that could have also contributed to this pandemic. So let me, let me ask you, uh, Mr. Thomas, beyond the pandemic, how much did the issues of insecurity, rate of uh, poverty, and um, the level of unemployment, uh, how much did it, you know, help to uh, slide us into this recession? Okay, largely a whole lot. Um, so with or without the pandemic, we probably would It's very convenient um, to say, I mean, the pandemic here yeah, because of the global effects it has. But when we look around uh, my environments, movements, commuting, little um, things like going from Lagos to Ibado, you'll probably spend about seven hours on the road. That's um, critical production or productive time that is being wasted just to commute from one hand to the other. Some of the things or figures are going to GDP computation beyond just the outputs, value adding things like moving uh, raw materials from the ports to the destination of the um, manufacturing companies all those have been constrained. Mm. And I mean, with all these bottlenecks, production is not as efficient as it's supposed to be. So there is need to, I mean, tackle insecurity. People can move around um, and feel secure because, I mean, you are either scared of um, headsmen or militants or whatever. Mm. Robbers and all the rest attacking you. If you don't mind holding okay. that thought for a while, just for a little bit to take um, a number of messages, so we'll be right back with you to contribute your thoughts. Please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. Mr. Thomas, you began by um, proffering a solution to security or insecurity. Um, with all these that uh, Mr. Laulua Kondia has just talked about, seems to be an attempt to address the questions of poverty and unemployment? Yes. And what do you think? How, how productive? Well, I think um, to a large extent, um, the effects will be far reaching in due course and over time. But essentially, as a country, for us to be able to, I mean, um, withstand the shock of recession and um, avoid it in the near future, we need to look at ways to diversify the um, foreign exchange source of the economy from all to other, I mean, real sectors. Because um, globally now, the world is um, gradually looking at facing out um, the use of fossil fuels. And that constitutes about 90% of our foreign exchange earnings. By the time, I mean, this current um, lull in demand and fall in price yeah, due to COVID, but I mean, beyond that, by the time economies, Western economies start looking at green energy alternatives and reduce the um, amount of um, 
fossil fuels, they are buying from us and other countries that export um, petroleum products or um, crude, then the price will definitely, I mean, be at the bottom um, end. And given the fact that the cost of production of oil is about $20, mm. if we are, I mean, selling at um, anything below 40 then we are even earning less than, I mean, the margin is less than the cost of producing it. So in the very near future, it is very critical that we look at, and we need to be very quick and uh, particular about it, at ways of diversifying the economy so that our over-dependence on oil gives way to other, I mean, before the advent of oil, we were doing um, a lot in agri sector, cocoa, cash crops, and all the rest. And even now, we can still continue to do that and look at how to even improve the value of that. Okay. For instance, um, last year, 2019, in Indonesia, um, Nigeria's oil um, export revenues were about 12 billion US dollars. While Indonesia, from oil palm alone, they got about 10 billion. The 12 billion um, US dollars we got accounted for about 50% of our revenues last year. While the 10 billion dollars uh, Indonesia got from um, oil palm accounted for less than 10 percent of their um, total revenue as a country, so we need to focus on other critical sectors that but, can. But, but there's something that you mentioned the other time, okay. which is that of um, uh, getting back into production, and I, I think that's also something that a number of people are thinking about. Um, Mr. Okeke, you also mentioned the, the need for us to get back into. Uh, production. Now, the challenge is right there for government, clearly. On the one hand is the economic sustainability plan that government has talked about and is talking about. You know, you heard the vice president's um, aide speaking there. On the other hand, are the tariff increases that seem to eat more, a little more into the revenues of the micro, small and medium enterprises, fuel price increase, because the these SMEs, the largely the micro and small businesses, use petrol generators more bec in the, because we do not have electricity, at least not significantly enough for now. And there is also that e electricity tariff increase for you know that cuts across you know a, a number of um, categories in the consumer bank. How do we address these? How do we balance these challenges out? Well, um, it, 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 it has never been easy, you know, in this economy when somebody goes into production or manufacturing. Um, uh, so the, 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 what is needed now, like I said earlier on, is the will, the will, the staying power, you know, to see positive changes within the economy. Because you have these policies of assault, you know, that have been working against many um, economic agents. A policy is in place. By the time you want to utilize it and you go into a certain field or certain area, the policy is changed. For instance, since, since this pandemic, coronavirus, you know, started early this year, the government has been coming up with so many policies. No, certainly I must tell you, some, are, some of them are ill-digested. In fact, some are counterproductive and some could work, if I do work against some of that in place. You understand? So with this one now, when you move forward as an SME or as an established organization and government comes out with a certain policy, suddenly that 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 will be that will be counterproductive. Let me mention this one, for example. When 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 a manufacturer, a producer in Nigeria here wants to import, you know, maybe equipment or whatever from abroad, and he is he is told that he cannot import anything unless directly from the manufacturer abroad. And if you go through a third party, and third party we mean somebody that is the agent of the manufacturer, and the government will not make a forex available to such person, it doesn't work like that. You know, because many organizations manufacture, just manufacture, produce, and they don't get involved in the distribution and all that. So if you from here connect their distributor abroad, the government will deny you forex. What that does, what that does is that that frustrated importer here now moves to the black market. And that black market, they fight the black market, is what we are seeing. And that is why part of part of why Nara is crashing. You know. So certain policies are counterproductive. And so when we when we 
you have, you have mentioned the the, the the plan and sustainability plan by the is it a long term plan? How long is it supposed to last? That's a short term plan. There is need for us to have a long term plan and begin to have the short short ones, you know, built into them, so that you know where you are going and when you talk about sustainability, we are not we are not looking we are looking at the long haul. You know, we're looking at the long haul. We're not looking at policies you make now and, and it becomes a kind of magic wand and something begins to work. No, it is slow and steady. And that is how the economy works. If you just inject something to the economy and it, it suddenly gets kick-started or jump-started, suddenly you, you, you may not see it last. So what I'm saying is that the government has to determine, you know, to do something for the other sector that will support agriculture and consistently show the will to do that, you know, let, let, let not let certain political decisions or indecisions not work against those sectors, and let it not be that somebody comes or born to borrow to be in charge and goes on to cancel certain existing policies, you know, that are working. You understand? So that puts that puts policy making policy making in this economy in a kind of crisis, you know. Policies uh, in a new movement. This one comes up. This one removes it. This one comes up. This one removes it. Like I'm now hearing. That every year, year that there's going to be a new finance act. I don't know. I don't know how that's going to be working. Because even the budget itself, because it's just one year plan, you see how we'll be grappling with it. Unfortunately, we don't bother to look at how far and how well we have done with each budget each year. If we do that, we will now see that the budgeting process or the budgeting uh, uh, practice in this uh, economy has just become a mere formality. Okay, so Mr. Okay, okay. Really well, well, let me let me see if I can take you up. Pardon me. Let me see if I can take you up on this issue before we begin to wind down on this conversation. Now, for some people, they think we we never even came out of that recession in 2016. And if you look at the figures, really, you see that we've not, we've never come back to that 4.0 growth that we had before the recession in 2016. We're still, you know, averaging 3, 2, 3, 2 over the years. So regarding policies, these policies don't just come up. They come up from a team. And most times the government says, well, this has been well thought of. Now, we still have that same team largely responsible for getting Nigeria out of this recession. So I'd like to ask, how much confidence do you have in the team, the economic handlers which we have in the country right now, from the Ministry of Finance to the Economic Advisory Council and other different teams that we have advice in the government. From what you have seen, how much confidence, how much trust do you have in them to get us out of this recession? If we are talking about the economic team per se, you should know that the, the committee set up by the president uh, last year is an advisory body. It's an advisory body. If they were to be internal people, you know, if they were, in fact, they are even external, if they were to be inside, you know, who, who, who not only take part in putting together the policy, but also drive the implementation, you are likely to achieve better results. But the way it is now, that economic team, the commission, or whatever, they are all outsiders. And so when you are making policy or trying to drive policy making from outside, you have problems. Because those on ground who are going to be the implementers, maybe they are not part and parcel of that, that policy uh, uh, making process. You know, by the time it gets to them, it becomes a given. That's something they must implement. And perhaps there could be a disparity between what they can do, you know, to realize those policies and what the people outside are seeing in making the policy they come up with. And that is, that is the, that's the character of the, of the current setup we have in government. And then you come to the issue of the will, the will of the government. Does it have the will to set down certain decisions and see them through? Like this policy now of uh, uh, leaving the liberalizing the uh, issue of fuel importation and, and so on and so forth. You know, why, where does that leave us with the building of refineries here in Nigeria? Where does that leave us with even running the existing uh, uh, refineries? What, where does that leave us with encouraging some uh, investors to even build refineries here? And so on and so on and so forth. So you have this kind of confusion. And we are talking about, you know, uh, selling some of our assets. And we have been talking that. So right, Mr. Okay, okay, just one moment now. Talking, talking solutions now. Um, I, I'd like you to take you up on this very, very quickly as we wind down, and then we'll come to Mr. Thomas to conclude. Well, there are those who also feel that if, for instance, the uh, in the family finances are down, 
uh, the parents will make some adjustments, cut some costs, and um, then just to help the uh, nation, to the family to stay afloat. Will it be too simplistic to assume that, you know, a country like Nigeria would also say, you know what, why doesn't government start from cutting the cost of governance in the fight to, in the struggle to solve this economic recession problem? Do you see that as a way to go? That is part of, that should be an integral part of the policy. Because there's a lot of wastages. There are a lot of leakages, you know, in the uh, in the economy from the government side. We have been talking about cost of go governance, cost of government in this country. So if what is going on now will make right. them, you know, to, to adjust and cost of cost, even if it's only on an experimental basis for this year and next year. You okay. talk about traveling. All right, all right, all right. We're running out of time, so let me let me just quickly take uh, Mr. Tunde Thomas on that as well as we wind down. Cutting cost of governance is this is it a way to go? Is uh, this something that can be done? I totally agree that it's something we need to look at because clearly, I mean, we have um, so many leakages in the government. Um, what are these leakages? Uh, democracy is um, a bit bloated. What are these leakages? I mean. The bicameral legislator we have and the um, mirror, I mean, largely we have a bloated. Um, but that's not something that's, that that's not a, an economic policy. That's more like uh, constitutional adjustments. Well, I think we need to look at that okay. to see how we can reduce um, the cost of governance. Mm. Um, even though the impact might not be so much, but I mean, this will be far reaching in the economy as well. And it will set the right example. For others to follow, okay. As we try to come out of this um, pandemic-induced uh, recession, okay. We have to thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tunde Thomas. He Thanks is an economist me. and associate director at GDL Asset Management Limited, uh, as well as Mr. Marcelo Keke, who is a board member at Nigeria Economic Summit Group (NESG). He's also an economist and CEO of Mascot Consult Limited. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and thoughts. We're back in a moment to take on another issue. Please stay with us. All right, now, you're not unaware that we've been having a number of health issues beside that of uh, COVID-19 uh, that we've been battling with since the beginning of this year. And, uh, of course, we knew it was happening. It came. Every nation was definitely least prepared. That, that was that. We're still struggling with it, still battling with it. And a number of nations are already in a second wave. But what is, seems to be making a second wave in Nigeria now, is yellow fever. And a good number of states in Nigeria have had their cases. How are we dealing with this? Let's begin with an epidemiologist and a virologist and public health epidemiologist. He joins us from our studio in Abuja, Dr. Akiala Ishaku. Thank you so much for your time this morning, and thank you for joining us. So, first of all, uh, we've known this since like 2017, and just what do you think we missed with all these new waves <coughs> coming on? Thank you, Ayo, and uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Ayo, and thank you, Kayode, for having me. Uh, I think um, uh, we are experiencing an epidemic in a pandemic. We're experiencing uh, a yellow fever epidemic in a COVID-19 pandemic. And I think that um, just like the way you established the background, in 2017-2018, we had an outbreak of yellow fever among the nomadics in uh, Kwara State although initially there was denial that it wasn't uh, a yellow fever, but when uh, the National Center for Disease Control and uh, the National Primary Health Care Agency uh, went into uh, you know, active case search of suspected cases, uh, samples were collected and it was revealed that uh, it was actually yellow fever. Now in this uh, global pandemic of COVID, we have seen pattern of spread uh, around uh, Delta State, around Inugu State, around Kogi State, and also around Bauchi State. So what did we miss? 
I hope you know that uh, yellow fever uh, is a vaccine preventable uh, disease. In fact, it is not even listed among the diseases of public health importance because, yeah, you can use vaccines uh, to, to actually uh, tackle it and then bring it to a halt. So where did we miss? We missed in our vaccination uh, immunization uh, strategy. Uh, once you take this vaccine, uh, a, a short dose, uh, you will be rest assured that uh, over a lifetime, you can have a immunity for this uh, disease. But uh, we end up seeing adults coming up with the, the, the disease. So I think quite significantly, there are people that have missed the yellow fever uh, vaccination uh, you know, timeline. So I think that uh, uh, what we need to do is to encourage uh, max vaccination and begin to have a target to that. Well, Secondly, this, this would uh, the vector that is, res that just, is responsible just a moment. for yellow fever. We'll, we'll, we'll solve the problems, uh, Dr. Ishaku, but there's something that you said now that I think we need to address because it sounds like it's a systemic thing. It sounds like it's a process thing that we missed. You said just now, and data also reveals the same thing, that adults are coming down with yellow fever. Some have died as a result of it. In fact, part of the data released by the NCDC indicates that people are as, as old as 35 have also died as a result of yellow fever in this current trend. So then, that would suggest that if the last time we had it before 2016 was 21 years before, it would suggest then that we started dropping the ball more than 21 years ago. That sounds like a systemic thing. What's the assurance that if we, just as you said, you know, solve this problem now, we vaccinate everybody, and it goes away again, what's the assurance we have that a repeat will not occur in another two decades from now? There is, there is an audio. So I, I, think, I think that, uh, so it is, I agree with you that it is a systemic uh, thing. And, and I, I quite also agree with you that uh, uh, we need to do uh, a lot of studies. Um, Ayo, uh, Kayode, what it is lacking, apart from being a systematic uh, reoccurrence kind of a, a pandemic, is that uh, we have missed, uh, we have actually missed a certain uh, component of it, which is research. Uh, now, beyond that, we also need to also check vaccine efficacy beyond being reoccurring as a systematic thing. Uh, uh, Ayo and the Kayode, in the early 70s, through Pawosu, Nigeria was given an accreditation by WHO to start manufacturing yellow fever vaccine. And Nigeria was producing that vaccine through the public national health reference lab in Yaba, Lagos, for the whole of West Africa. We lost it. Now, these vaccines that we are getting now, they are coming from Europe and other parts of South America. Have we done immunological studies to look at the vaccine efficacy, even among our population? Have we also, uh, you know, uh, brought in entomologists because the vector that transmits yellow fever is actually a mosquito? So I want to commend entomologists in the Abu Virus uh, Research Institute in Inugu for doing a lot of studies. But can we also check whether there is also a species spatiation of these viruses, of, of these mosquitoes in these areas? So we have a lot of things to do. Uh, we must not wait that after 10 years, after 20 years, after 30 years, we begin to have a exactly reoccurrence of these uh, uh, diseases. These are vaccine preventable diseases. So we need, we need, we need to come up with a national policy on even addressing most of these things. Ayo, we are underestimating a lot of diseases, hemorrhagic fever diseases. We are, we are not talking, we, in fact, we are underreporting hepatitis E because hepatitis E, hepatitis B, yellow fever present the same clinical signs and symptoms with yellow fever. 
So what we just need to do as a nation if to avoid the reoccurrence of this is actually we're in a 21st century that is knowledge driven. We need to pop resources into research. We need to go into research to actually see whether these mosquitoes that transmit this yellow fever have actually undergo some mutation. Actually, or we, so we could also see whether what the we'll global uh, warming has actually affected this Dr. species' uh, uh, population density. Mm. You know, on that on that issue of so research, let me just let's so try to explore fun. that. Pardon me, Dr. Shaku. I mean, let's explore some of the issues you have raised. And we have joining us this morning also on the program, uh, Dr. Oyewana Godwin, who is a Supervising Commissioner of Health and Human Services, Bainu Estate, and also the Commissioner of Energy, Science and Technology. Uh, good morning and thank you for joining us on Sunrise Daily. Uh, I'd like to take you up. We'll come to what's happening in Bainu Estate in a moment. But Dr. Ishaku, our guest in Abuja, raised an issue, a very important issue, regarding research. Now, I know that science and technology is also your area uh, of supervision in this state. So regarding that, just how much research have we carried out into yellow fever, the vector that spreads it, how much mutation has happened, how we can stay ahead of this epidemic, as, as he has put it pretty much. Just how much research have we done? Well, um, thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, the research that we have done, as far as benefit is concerned, is a bit elaborate. Uh, you know, this is not the first time this disease has been coming to Benue State. I think as far back as 1986, there was this massive outbreak in the local government area of Benue State. And since then, the Benue State government have taken this matter to the level that it ought to be. And then in uh, the year 2019, there was still another outbreak in about three local government areas in Benue State. And since then, the governor of Benue State have really, really developed a keen interest. What can we do to checkmate this virus, viral hemorrhagic fever? And then the vector, what can we do at least to checkmate it? And then if it is bringing a lot of mutants, what can we do? So we actually sent samples to various research laboratories. And then as we are talking right now, research is still ongoing the best way, and what is the best way that we can do to curtail if there are mutants that are coming up? Why is this, this thing resurging in Benue State? And until we get the result of our findings, we cannot come up with any definitive solution for now. But we are not resting on our horses. We are doing something to make sure that this thing is curtailed and then brought to the nearest minimum. Thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Uh, Godwin, we will be back to you to continue this conversation after this. Thanks for staying with us. Dr. You wanna well, the explanations you have given, you know, would probably give us an idea of how government has handled this matter over the years. But then I'd like to ask you, this outbreak that according to information available has taken the lives of 20 valuable Nigerians. And that of the 80s that you referenced, any similarities in the way we handled them and the way it's coming? Yes, the way, the way we are handling this present, and, and uh, actually the, the number that you just brought up now is less than what we have right now. Uh, as of yesterday, we have 53 deaths, 53 altogether, and then the number of deaths in the hospital is 25, and then the death in the community is 28. Um, the way we are handling it now, this RCCE pillar, risk communication and community engagement pillar, we are trying to step it up. You know, when this thing came up and we, we had a report that 17 deaths were recorded as at 11th, of November. The people thought that it was something else. They had a list superstitious mind and prejudice that the gods were angry with the community because some youth told something. And then this pillar that we erected went round 
in a quick response, a quick response being set up by the Excellency, the Executive Governor of Benin State, to find out what is really the problem. So we, the, 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 the team first went to that place in an emergency response to get the feedback from the people and then carry out sampling. We discovered, the people that went there discovered certain things that this thing is ranging between eight, I mean, uh, between uh, uh, 15 and 35 years, and mostly males, those 17 deaths that were first recorded. And then they begin to wonder what really happened. And then the people brought up this kind of superstition I talked about. But the suspicion after carrying out verbal autopsy proved otherwise. The verbal autopsy that was carried out, they began to suspect something else. They began to suspect that it's viral hemorrhagic fever. We interv they interviewed opinion leaders, community leaders, religious men, traditional rulers in that community. The, the, the name of that community is called Epelo, in the Baribu local government area of Benue State. So they actually went further to find out what is the source of water that these people have. And the environment as a whole, the kind of symptoms that the people that were dying displayed before they died. And then the people that are alive, that are suspected to have uh, the, uh, the virus, and then it was suspected that what actually the people had was viral hemorrhagic fever. And then they took samples and took it to the National Reference Laboratory of NCDC. I think two days on the 16th of November, the result came out that it was actually yellow fever. Um, and, uh, so when the result came out, we mount up very massive campaign to the people that it, not, it was not what we were suspecting. It is yellow fever. We met with different kinds of communities. Right. The, the, the yeah, I understand. We'll get to some of these measures uh, you are, you're putting in place in a moment. But it, it's quite interesting, really, because if you say that the, the oldest uh, is 35 years to have died from yellow fever, mm -hmm. and you said that there was an outbreak in 1986 in a Jew local government area, 1986, that's about 34, 35 years from now. But... My, my challenge with all this is, you said that a lot of them thought that this was something uh, diabolical, something from the gods. The gods were angry. And it begs the question, if there was an outbreak as far back as 1986 and there were subsequent, you know, sensitization across the states, why would people still attribute such deaths to diabolical means of the gods if they had knowledge? So that begs the question, was there indeed some form of sensitization over the years for people of those local government areas? Yes. There was, you know, there are certain communities that once they have an opinion, sometimes it's difficult to change their opinion. When this thing happened in 1986, I think I was still in secondary school or thereabout, thereabout, I knew that even as far back as I did see, people were coming, even white men were coming, and they were mass, I mean, they released a lot of uh, pamphlets to the people that we should take care of our environment, take care of the, the kind of sleep that we have, distributed nets, and then did everything possible to make sure that the water sources were corrected. In fact, they sank boreholes. And the people actually were made to understand that this thing is not the kind of uh, thing that people were expecting. And then even last year, again, like I told you, it happened again in three local government areas in Benue State. This massive campaign also came up again. And each time, the government is taking measures. The measures that the government, especially that was being last year, the government took adequate measures in conjunction with our partners, UNICEF and uh, Gavi. And then the, 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 the government mobilized resources and campaign massively that the people should take care. All right, now, Dr. Iwana, we'll, we'll, we'll need to uh, take on uh, Dr. Shaku, but in a moment, I, I just want to find out, what does, how does sinking boreholes solve the problem of yellow fever? 
you know, the, the, the water that people drink. Let me tell you now what is, what is being happening in, in, the, in one of the local government, that we, one of the, the communities that we went to. The water that they drink, actually they combine it with cattle. Cattle come to drink water from that source. Human beings go there to drink water. And this vector, the vector that is transmitting this uh, virus is a mosquito. It's, 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 it's mosquito. They call it Aedes aegypti. And they lay their eggs in rotting environment. That kind of environment that you see, that kind of stagnant water that they do drink, they lay their eggs in such an environment because they emit this kind of odor, a kind of acidic odor that they use in multiplying their eggs. And when the eggs are multiplied in such an environment, people go there to fetch water from that same place that this vector is multiplying their eggs. When they drink this water, of course, they will be down with, uh, with this viral hemorrhagic fever. So water is, very, is an important source of transmission of this uh, vector, especially stagnant water and very dirty water. That is why source of water is very, very important. Right. So if you take care of the, 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 the water here, Okay, so it seems you just pointed out to two major issues. So let's go to Dr. Shaku uh, in Abuja studio. So he's talked about, that's the Commissioner uh, for Health in, in Benue State, the Supervising Commissioner. He's talked about, you know, people and their beliefs that this may have influenced what we're seeing now. But then he also talked about water. And I mean, you understand that for a lot of these communities, the government is meant to be responsible for providing portable water such that they don't have to go to areas where, uh, areas that are mosquito infested. So really, when you weigh these realities, who would you say takes more of this blame in what we're seeing now? The people or the government? So, Ayo Kayode, in the 21st century, we are discussing about water pro provision. <laughs> supposed to be the responsibility of government <laughs> at local government level, even at the state level, uh, not talking about the federal level. So, uh, in the 21st century, we are talking about uh, water pro pro provision. I, I think it is archaic. Uh, so, I will blame the government for this. Uh, uh, but, but by and large, you will discover that uh, water plays a critical role in the transmission of yellow fever. I quite agree with that uh, because um, water serves as a source of breeding ground for these mosquitoes where they lay their eggs, uh, but in a stagnant water. Um, so uh, we are not supposed to have problem of uh, provision of water within the middle belt because uh, the river Benue Basin serves as a tributaries for us to also create artificial dams, for us to also uh, create a portable drinking water for people. Uh, so uh, I think it is quite key that we see this as a responsibility of government and government need to sit up uh, to look into that. We must not wait for partners uh, to come and help us in provision of water. It should be responsibility of government but also it is a responsibility of communities. And I think that uh, even in my community, government did not uh, dig, uh, 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 provide a source of water. We came as uh, community members and then were able to raise uh, a source of water, which is the borehole. So I think uh, government has a portion of blame, uh, but also community needs to take responsibility. Well, but from what- By and large, we need to see to how we can come up with our sanitary policies as a country. Um, Ayo Chambali, if you live in places like where I come from, you will discover that even within household, people are planting maize, uh, guinea corn, uh, trees that are quite tall. These are also breeding sites for mosquitoes. So why can't we have a policy to limit the kind of crops that we plant what, around Dr. our Shaku, Dr. Oshaku, what ended that policy? in the first place? If, because if you remember, you know, back in time, I think you have also referenced that earlier, uh, we had sanitation officers at the local government level, all right, that went from place to place to ensure that, you know, these things that we're talking about don't even happen in the first place. You know, they ensure that your water, the water you, you drank, they, they inf investigated inside your homes to ensure that the water you drank was safe and good enough for you if you didn't have the right port the right water container they trashed it and all of that uh, at what point did we lose that and um 
uh, isn't that something that should be systemic as well? Just, you know, we began with saying that. I think what you are referencing on, we have not seen it in the last 20, 25, 30 years. <laughs> when we have sanitation officers at local government level going to house, household to household to check. This is like in 25, 30 years ago. It's not obtainable now. You hardly see environmental sanitation officers at local government level. You even hardly can you see health educators officers at local government level, hardly can you even see uh, town criers, health town criers, at local government level. So I agree with you. It's something that needs to be sustained. And I think we need to revisit such kind of policies. In fact, uh, health educators, uh, uh, environmental sanitation officers uh, will even be able to be part of policy formulations. Uh, we need their feedback from the grassroots, and then we we'll do what is called bottom-top approach. Those are the things. So I agree with you that we need to sustain that. But we well, we'll only sustain something that is happening or that is ongoing. We don't even have it. I can categorically tell you that in my state, I hardly see that. I hardly see health educators at local government level and environmental uh, health, health, health practitioners at local government level. So we just need to look at this. Things. We are not yes. only looking at uh, just just uh, a moment, uh, Doctor uh, Ishaku. Fever. How yeah. about hepatitis E? Mm. Just, just a moment, Doctor Ishaku. One of the issues also raised, you know, by the Supervising Commissioner of Health in Benue State, also revolves around risk communication. It would seem like communicating to the people in the first place for them to to even understand the enormity of what they are contending with or the risks that they expose themselves to isn't even there in the first place. Now, that's definitely, because already we have a good number of states, Bauchi, Delta, Enugu, a number of states are already battling with yellow fever now, and you say there are other risks that are out there that we are not uh, doing anything about. So, what should we be doing? We know that there are intervention groups at the state levels, and we also know that the NCDC at the center also has some interface with some of these um, intervention uh, bodies of the state. So that issue of risk communication is there, and we don't seem to be doing enough, or are we? I think we need to do, uh, yes, yeah, so I agree with you that risk communication is quite key. And when the Honorable Commissioner, Supervising Commissioner, was talking about issues of belief and all what have you, I felt like um, uh, the risk communication component of uh, this uh, health advocacy has not been done uh, well. Uh, so I agree with you that there is no limit to uh, public awareness about the health uh, uh, safety of uh, citizens. So I, I think we need to do more. Uh, maybe we need to re-strategize uh, most of our uh, risk communication uh, strategy. Uh, but what is quite key is that we need to build capacity of risk communication and health education advocacy at the grassroots level. So I, I wish to pros prescribe this to the National Primary Health Care and even the uh, NCDC that we need to build capacity. Uh, we, ne we must not wait for NCDC to send a rapid response teams to state. We must not wait for state to send rapid response teams to local government. What we need to do is to build capacity of, a, you know, a kind of a robust capacity at grassroots level. Uh, and once we achieve that, most of these things, uh, we will be done with them. We need to also bring stakeholders, traditional rulers. We need to also bring faith, uh, uh, you know, uh, base organization. We need to also bring uh, 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 people within community and begin to build uh, capacity. We need to change the dynamics, the strategy on how we do a lot of this health education. We also, we, 
we are on TV now. Not mm. everybody in the village can be able to have access to uh, television, even have electricity. So we can begin to marshal out how we can be able to reach out to them. So Ayokayo Day, if I am in a, in a, in a, in a remote area in Kauranamuda and I have an MTN network and I want to dial to check my balance for my credit and I put star 556 hash, I should be able to get a health communication message because uh, handset, you know, is closer to the people even than TV, even than, you know, getting people around to come around. So we need to reach it and do a lot of uh, healthcare uh, uh, strategy uh, in terms of risk communication is quite you know, key. Dr. Then, Shaku, I thought you were going to... Even when we are Dr. formulating Shaku. policies. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought you were going to uh, prescribe town crier, just like you said earlier, but you know, maybe that's a cake. But, but let's take on uh, Dr. Olai uh, Oyiwana, pardon me, uh, on some of these issues you have raised. You, you talked about capacity, which is quite important. And I'd like to find out, Commissioner, in terms of capacity, just how much do you have in Bainway State? Because I, I was looking at a report that the NCDC released just before now regarding the, uh, uh, the, the situation report of yellow fever. And for Bainway State, I saw that there were only three samples taken that's test. I'm, I'm sure that's days ago. So that puts a big question mark on the issue of capacity. So how much capacity do you have in terms of sensitization, in terms of carrying out these tests, transporting them back and forth? How much capacity do you have? Yes. The, initially, at the onset, clearly the capacity may not really be enough. But since we got the, the sample test, that this is actually yellow fever. The governor of Benin State has mobilized resources and we have built a lot of capacity since then. And as we are talking right now, the response teams, they are all over the local government, not just the, the, local, the target local government, but other contiguous local governments. And that you know that uh, the one that happened in Enugu State, for instance, is very close to Benin State. And even Kogi State, they have boundary in Benin State. So we have built a lot of capacity over time. As I'm talking about, a lot of here caregivers have been recruited, even from the community. And then we launched a lot of massive campaigns in the area to make sure that this is exactly the way you should handle your issues in the state, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the state, in the local government. So we have actually, we are enlarging our capacity. We are enlarging it to such an extent that this thing shouldn't just be restricted to the area in question, to the target area. The FLO community, for instance, where this thing started from, if you go to that place right now, initially, the boreholes that, that we are talking about, many of them were archaic. As we are talking right now, if you go to that place now, the borehole is flowing. In fact, I went there recently, I took the, the water, I, and then they also complained about other boreholes that were no longer functioning. The government is doing everything possible to make sure that they revitalize the borehole. And then we asked them to bring able-bodied men and women, we we'll train them, on a standard pra operational practices, and then we train them, we bring them on board to make sure that they are part of, part and parcel of this campaign. And we are not. As just, it stands uh, right now, Doctor Iwana, how many samples have been taken for testing? As at yesterday, we took about uh, eleven samples. As at yesterday, we took about eleven samples to N NCDC for analysis. That is those that we, you know, sometimes you have to suspect, you have to, you know, you are, going to, you are not going to foreclose that this is only uh, yellow fever. Uh, since we are suspecting that it's viral hemorrhagic fever, we're also suspecting other ones like Lapa fever, but we don't pray that such things should come to our environment. So we are taking on some other samples, but by and large, the symptoms they are showing, everybody is showing, appears to be the same thing. So we are waiting for the, the results from the uh, NCDC reference laboratory right now. The samples you have taken, uh, are they the same as the suspected cases you have? Because as at last week, you had over 23 suspected cases. So have you taken enough samples regarding the suspected cases in your state? That, the sample taking is still ongoing. We are still taking, like I told you, as, as at yesterday, we, taking, we took 11 samples. Today, we will take samples. We will continue to take samples. And right now, uh, today, we are going to launch a massive immunization campaign. And it is starting, the Benue State is taking off today, and we are going to launch it in pretty local government areas in Benue State. And 
Uh, the reason why we are going to say have 23 local government areas, but we are doing it in 20 because three has already been uh, vaccinated in 2019. So we are doing it in only 20 right now. So we are taking the, the sample taking is ongoing. And as we are taking it based on the people that they are bringing. And you know, one of the reasons why you have this kind of figure, like I told you, 57, many of the persons were brought almost dead on arrival. They will wait until the, the dying moment before they bring the people to the, to the hospital. But this kind of advocacy we are taking right now to make sure that when we even send them two free uh, telephone numbers, give everybody in all the communities two free lines. They will call. When somebody is displaying any set of uh, uh, symptoms, you report immediately. Okay. The caregivers will go to that. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'll Dr. Like yeah. Dr. Iwana, uh, these diseases that you talked about, clearly they usually happen in the rural areas. Is that correct? Uh, mostly in rural areas for now. Okay. Well, now, um, that also suggests that um, they are probably happening more in the border towns with other states. So, um, you, the, you know, Benue State has, you know, borders with a number of states, Cross River, Ebonyi, Enugu, Kogi, and Nasarawa as well as Taraba State. Are you having conversations with any of these state governments also to ensure that the spread is controlled so that it doesn't go beyond, you know, uh, Benue State? What, what kind of conversations are you having with any of these border states? Uh, we've actually initiated a conversation with the uh, state of, uh, government alone for now, and uh, we, we intend making a contact with the uh, Enugu state and all the other states that have borders uh, with Benue state. And like I said, we just initiated conversation with the state government, and we are trying to put our heads together to make sure that this thing doesn't escalate. And as we are talking right now, maybe today we initiate conversation with other states that are bordering Benue state. Well, uh, on a final note, Dr. Ishaku, you said that we're having an epidemic in a pandemic. Some have said we're not paying as much attention to yellow fever as we paid to COVID-19. So as part of your parting shots in, in a few seconds, what are the takeaways for us, really? What can we learn from our response to COVID-19 that we can now use for yellow fever? So, uh, Dr. Ishaku, uh, my, my parting words will be that um, uh, we need to uh, actually strengthen our surveillance system, just like the way we strengthen uh, uh, that for COVID. Uh, we need to also see to how we can uh, be able to build capacity in terms of risk communication, even in terms of surveillance, in terms of disease notification. Uh, at grassroots level, which is quite key, uh, we need to also come up with certain national policies Ayo and Kayo, they, what stops us from saying that uh, one of the, apart from your date of birth uh, certificate, one of the eligibility criteria for you to enter primary school or a nursery school is for you to present your vaccination card. From there, we should be able to get uh, people, uh, children that have not yet been vaccinated. There are a lot of children that have missed vaccination in this country. And so if we come up with such kind of national policies, we should be able to target children that are quite vulnerable and be able to see to how we can be able to tackle most of these uh, vaccine preventable diseases. We have to we thank you very much. see to how we can do research. Hmm. Research is quite key. Yeah. And I think that uh, uh, we are not also looking at in the direction of uh, other hemorrhagic fever like hepatitis E. So we need to see to how we can be able to, hepatitis E, Lassa fever, uh, yellow fever, they have the same symptomatology uh, complex. They present virtually the same uh, symptoms, except for those, they are route of transmission that it is fecal oral. So uh, I Dr. Think as a country, Akiala we, Ishaku, we have to thank you very much because we are completely out of town, uh, out of time, beg your pardon, uh, on this conversation. But your contributions have been most certainly significant today. Dr. Akiala Ishaku is a virologist and public health epidemiologist. He is currently a research resident fellow with Nigeria Field Epidemiology Training Program, support staff to WHO CDC 
and is a lecturer, a senior lecturer with Biological Science Department of Nasara State University. Thank you so much for your time and your thoughts, as well as Dr. Godwin Oyewana, who is Supervising Commissioner of Health in Human Resources, beg your pardon, Human Services in Benway State. He is also Commissioner in Charge of Energy, Science and Technology in the same state. Thank you so much for your time and thoughts. Well, just before we go, a couple of comments uh, coming from you oh, yeah. and both seem to be talking about economic recession. Absolutely. But on Joshua says Nigeria's economic recession is tweeting about that, saying that why is Nigeria the first in West Africa to have nosedived into recession? Yes, COVID-19 is one of the factors, but government's inability to tackle insecurity, corruption, high cost of governance are what have crippled the economy. I don't think that's any help in there. The government lacks management ability, he says. Well, Professor Inakena says, on the same issue, government must come out from the shackles of desperate economic policies to economic programs that will take the country out of poverty, provide enabling environment for investment, enact policies that are humane and capable of generating capacity for development and employment. Well, to comments and um, so many others, of course, you can check out yourself on our Twitter handle at Sunrise Daily Now. Until then, my name is Ayo Makide. Have a wonderful day. And I'm Kairo Kikulu. Thank you for joining us.